Well, hello and welcome to the stream. Let's go ahead and see what we can get into. We're going to do a little coast to coast AM, Art Bell, with uh, this appear premiered on January 2006, the 28th. It's the full shift. I know, I think most of you. I'm going through a, a grieving process. Um, the loss of my beloved Ramon. I just realized something before the show. Um, music is uh, important, and I haven't. I've been going through this uh, wild, these wild waves of grieving, and uh, music actually helps. I I kind of shied away from it because all the words seem to mean something, you know, connected with uh, Mona. And so, but, but, but I was wrong. Um, it's good. I've decided it's good, and, and that leads me to one other comment before we begin what we're going to do tonight, and, that, and that's bullshit. We're going to talk bullshit here tonight, and we're going to wait for you to watch it for you. But then, if you listen, if you do get to call it tonight, I understand that the, uh, the information for you is going to be able to call in, express your private condolences and everything, but I would ask you not to do that. Um, this program is something that I can make the first I show in. Something that can take me away for four hours on two nights. Take me away. And that's exactly what I want to do. So I'm going to throw myself into the topic, throw myself into the show, which is not hard for me to do. And um, so I'm going to ask you to do this. Uh, 
and to some degree the hell with everybody else. Uh, America is more dependent than any other nation on the face of the earth in electronic communication. I mean, we are virtually at this point basing our entire economy on it, Lord. So we'd be white. Now, from that point of view, I mean, if, if the people living out in the jungle somewhere in a village, they probably go, oh, uh, but here in America, everything's electrical, you know, everything. Right, but uh, you know, there's, it's like a, it's like the uh, the picture says about the bottle. I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. And what's happening here is that there are certain anomalies in the solar system and on our Earth that have got access to them, have got researchers uh, writing down what's happening, and a lot of people are wondering how quick it might happen. Okay, well, I'm one of them. Uh, 
that would again cause uh, the Earth to have just enough of it that would uh, be possible for the Earth to tip over its axis from that event alone. All right, I'm going to stop you right there. I now note that there have been two headlines given to us this half hour, so of which you're welcome to check out. You can think of them as crazy, or you can go find out for yourself one. The South's magnetic field has doubled. Two, the Chandler wobble, and I'm sure many of you have heard of that, has sunk. We have the bottom of the, the day here. In the day that uh, Lloyd believes more strongly that this is about to occur from a scientific point of view, and he's laid a couple of big ones on us. The certain magnetic, magnetic field has doubled. And the Chandler wobble has stopped. Now, some say that it does stop every now and then. I was not aware of that. We'll ask about that in a moment. I know he also has some religious conviction, or at least I think he does, that this is going to occur. I wonder which is the most influential. We'll ask in a moment. <laughs> Things are not changing. Uh, Matt Drebschneid says that uh, Phoenix has, uh, has gone 101 days without rain. That ties the all time record for Phoenix. Northwest is getting drenched. And the weather certainly is a heady one. There's no question about that. Uh, Lloyd, let me ask you that now. There is a, a, a sort of a religious underpinning also, uh, which we isn't there. Absolutely. The company that hired me to do this 13 city tour is called the Property Club. And they care about it. It's called Town Property. And if you want to see my uh, schedule, I can go to 777 with the Professor Letter. That's where my uh, itinerary is because there's no way to read off all the city houses boxes in my house. I am going to see these next week in Portland and in Detroit and in the neighbor city in Portland. It's not even going to be a study. It's going to be well into a record without rain unless they have a quick storm that I doubt it. Right. And uh, I kind of cover the, the weather problem too as best I can at 777.com because you can just. I'm going to just read my account. I don't want to do about my other stuff, but the religious part of it, the prophecy club, this is my sixth tour for them, then, and uh, we have been very successful because what I try to do is put the facts first, but I actually fit in it. I didn't tell you that this is amazing to me. The Bible and the book of Isaiah says that people who will roll and walk like a drunkard uh, in the book of uh, Revelation, it says that it will roll as a scroll and that the uh, that the north will become the south in effect. There are about a half a dozen places in the Quran to talk about the Bible. Uh, uh, that's a nice copy. That's a nice copy. That's a nice copy. The Bible and the Quran is all speaking of it. You know, I, I think it's reasonable to assume. The Upanishad, the Bhagavad Gita, Chinese religion, uh, uh, that there is no major respect of religion that does not have something about a fellowship in its history and a definite impact past prophecy of the earth world and the earth world. I am tired of saying about that story. Now, do you, inside yourself, uh, Lloyd, do you give more weight to the religious? Most of the world would be learned of the science. Uh, Art, the only reason I was able to do over 500 radio television shows about a space on specific ocean is because the science comes first. Uh, I, I believe that it's very important. If you lose respect, you have, a, you have an incredible idea to surround yourself with respected people that uh, are well known and uh, then you do the test. Somebody wrote that the Chandler Wobble is supposed to stop every now and then. Is that true? Oh, it's not stopped every now and then, but every now and then it can mean like every uh, several years, and it's been stopped for days now, and it keeps saying uh, it has moved, and why hasn't it moved? And in um, Texas, by the way, today, Texas uh, had an entire lake that was completely dry. Uh, there's the biggest drought that's ever hit Texas and Oklahoma right now. There are weather and company companies on this planet that are just amazing. I can't argue that. It certainly is occurring. And 
Is it a precursor to what's coming? Is it part of what's coming? Or is it because it is separate? I do. I believe that. I think that there's more things that happen. There's nothing else about being true. When you and I were to school, we were talking about it's not perfectly around. It's like a little bit like an ASMR because it's not a little bit more than the equator. I'm trying to say that the equator is reached the point where it's actually a little more in circumference, which creates a circle around the whole by 27 miles. Two sciences. Yeah. 
But I remember from my rabbi, someone the very first thing he ever mentioned in the Bible, I didn't know it. He said, Look, that the Bible is not a lot of words, and the reason I had a word from the Bible was to me when God gave us a lot of faith. So I would separate the house and the house. What I meant, if you will, is that God put a faith on issue four. And the last of the prophecy of God is that right before the world comes to an all time, it's not the faith of God. I'm switching it up to have
How many holes are there in like XP? I'm like, current operating systems on uh, XP Pro, XP Pro Home are pretty good operating systems, but um, it seems like they keep discovering new holes all the time because they don't get into it. I mean, will Microsoft ever produce the last patch? <laughs> I, I don't think so, but can't really pick up Microsoft that's really, you know, all computer operating systems are developed by people, you know, that you need to have a human factor, yeah. so we come to error. And unfortunately, you know, back in the day when, you know, Windows XP Pro was coded or Windows, you know, Windows 2000, and you know, I mean, in the legacy system, it was developed by first years of developers that were on particular coding practices. So what has happened is the operating systems have been released and there's a lot of bugs and a lot of flaws that security researchers can identify and exploit. And then once they're exploited, they release the information to the public over the internet and anybody can exploit it. All right, let's look at that. This uh this other operating system just over the horizon I think there's a name for it. So um how do you know about all of these security holes when one one comes out, it should be absolutely flawless, right? Yeah. Uh, there's always going to be security vulnerabilities, human developed computer programs, and there's always going to be problems. Uh, the thing that we need to do is you know, be aware that these systems aren't 100% perfect and they develop a, a defensive depth model. So we have to presume that the computer that's connected to the internet can be compromised. But then knowing this in the back of your mind, what can you do to limit the damage? And that's really how you have to think. Think about all these companies that are out there that would be a firewall. And uh, like over the internet, like for e-commerce, for example. And they have the company firewall, but they still have to allow the public to connect to their website so they can't do business. And so what they do is they hire them to, you know, a programmer and develop the web application. That the, uh, that the company is using uh, the products and services. Well, Kevin, what do you know on the secure site? I see there is a little check there. And they basically say, well, not really. I mean, there's, there's, there's a tactic, and what you're talking about is uh, uh, using uh, what we call the secure socket player. You know, how can all this be locked? That's right. I that mean, that any information. Uh, that can be sent with encrypted and also like you have a reasonable level of confidence you're talking to a real site, not a bunch of site. Uh, what I'm asking is, do I have a reasonable level? If, if, can I reasonably expect that I'm safe? Now, what you can think about is one of the threats. Is there a, for an attacker to come specifically out for you? Out for you into what we call what, what the term is called demand in the middle of that. And what that what that allows the attacker to do is even if you're using a secure connection, there's a way to trick uh trick you as attacking to the attacker and the attacker actually connects to the real site and monitors all the information flowing in between, kind of like what the NFA was doing. And I'm glad you put up the NSA. Uh, let's have a little talk about that and sidetrack for a moment. The NSA is this. They're listening to the Twitter page. Well, the NSA is listening to probably all overseas uh, communications. I would bet. Now, would you go beyond that? We can say the NSA is listening to even domestic. Conversations, do you think they've got big computers listening for keywords even domestically? I would think so. But don't, don't forget, now that we have voice over IP, we have a you know, analog and digital you know, communications, we have you know, gigabytes of traffic over the, over the internet. You know, okay. so that we have a lot of data to shift from. So you have to think about, well, yeah, all these types of data, how are they determining what pieces of information? Yeah, you imagine that you're calling these uh, companies up to the telephone and their voice recognition systems are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty well done. So you have to think for government standards ahead. 
Um, so they probably aren't monitoring domestically as well as internationally. They're just monitoring. I don't really know. I would, I would suspect they are. They would be, I guess, too. Now, my question to you is, this is not let's hear it. On the one hand, we are fighting a war on terrorism. We believe these people want to kill us, and they're making plans to kill us. So, we have a good reason to listen. Is it a good enough reason to listen? We have a constitution which is sort of crumbling under the effort. Uh, the Trump Amendment is sinking lower and lower and lower. And so, my question to you is in your mind, Kevin, that's a hard question to answer because we're adopting two very important interests, the interest of privacy and the interest of security. And I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you know, our core public uh, are shot inside in order well, yeah, you know, our public to protect the, our constitutional rights. And for the United States government, or for the state for that matter, to not comply with the uh, constitutional protections of causes, you know, causes me to really think about the issue. Um, so I, I kind of lean toward relief that the uh, government authorities have to abide by constitutional protections. So I'm mean, telling you that. Uh, if you were the president of the United States, you would not have signed that authorization. Mm -hmm. If I was the president of the United States, you probably would have. <laughs> so, I, I, I would want the ground truth. I want the, uh, the intelligence uh, of the day to argue. That's not if I was the president, I probably would have. That's the real test question. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. And I actually, people will be, some will be appalled, but I think if I were the president, and I, I'm looking at the threats of the country that I was going to protect. I do what I could do. I think I'm I think I'm sorry. Yeah, I do. I really do. But we are really on the war. And I don't know any other way around it. Honestly, I don't. And I understand that it prompts on the Constitution. But uh, I don't know. I think, well, what I, think, I think the war trumps it. Yeah, I think that is important, but I also think that the intel that is gathered during with this country should not be uh, available to law enforcement agencies. For example, if they're at the NSA is monitoring conversations, they you know, learn some guys are looking, you know, how they should be able to pass that information to the US people. I think that would, you know, really infringe on constitutional protections, but if they actually undercover a terrorist block, well, the more powerful. Well, what about if they uncover domestic terrorism? What if they stumble into another nickel, somebody wants to blow up a building somewhere? Terrorism is terrorism, whether it's international or domestic, is so, so, yeah, that should be passed on. Yeah, in my opinion. But I, you know, I, you know, I, you know the Congress is responsible for legislation. You know, the Congress is really responsible for enacting the laws, uh, you know, so. They're going to do what they want to do, and then I mean, the laws are supposed to be enforced, but then there's all these uh, exceptions of uh, rules, and usually the government goes uh, within these exceptions to allow them to monitor uh, communications, especially under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or the Communication uh, Fraud. Well, yeah. your answer is very interesting. On one hand, you're against it, and on the other hand, if you were the president, you'd be doing it too. I would not be in If I was not, you know, I left myself in the position of having the top of the in and uh, if I did have the top I had to protect the country, and uh, I, I could use it to get the ground for the first of the purpose. All right. Uh, what is social engineering? The audience. We did this before, but go ahead. Well, social engineering is a technique used by identity thieves by hackers. Even by law enforcement, social engineering is really using manipulation, perception, and influence to get the person to comply with requests. 
and the social engineering that, that's relevant to computer hacking is where we would advise guys calls or emails, somebody over the uh, emails or calls over the telephone, you can listen to the first thing that you should do for vision, and then you can try to realize Yeah, not at all. 
So I was purely challenging in, in seduction of danger and adventure and intrigue. I would, I guess I would F some of my interest, but in today's world, a lot of the people that are using hacking skills, new skills to steal, are really profit, are profit motivated. They're not really into this activity for the passion of the technology. Like, in other words, from your point of view, Devin, uh, it's not pure hackers. Correct. And you have a big bag, you have a pure hacker. That might be a kid in high school that, uh, that does something on the school computer because they're interested in yeah. how far they can go. Yes. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have some terrorist group that wants to hack into a telephone company switch because they want to bring down telephone service from an area where they're going to do a physical attack. So you have, you have a mixed bag here. There's no real, it's not really one good answer. In, the second book I wrote in the Art of Intrusion, what I did is I told several stories of different hackers who had different agendas and illustrated the different techniques that they would use to break into systems and how they would cover their tracks. And um, that book is out now, right? The Art of Intrusion. Art of Intrusion. Yeah, and if anybody's interested, they could go to Amazon, like your last book, Death. So we can actually read parts of the book for free on that. Okay. Uh, so, so we have two different kind of hackers, one motivated financially, one motivated uh, well, the, the pure thrill, the pure everything that goes with it, not the money. Now let's let's talk about the money people for a second, because Sam and I earlier today said, you know what? People can download, they don't have to be an expert in computers, they can download a program. It will let them become one of these mob masters. In other words, you don't really have to know anything about the damn thing except how to buy a program. And then you set yourself up at the top of a pyramid and you make money. Well, I think what they were, uh, what they were uh, mentioning on, on, on the show, which I actually did not see, was probably people that have actually compromised a number of computers that have been built Oh, yeah. 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 Y
to a class of computer hackers who were into the experimentation and the exploration of the passion for this full board technology. And it's all, I think, we learned from amateur radio and the old phone freaks of the 1970s. I think a lot of people want to know what they say it's going to be. I do. Um, we have enemies, uh, very serious enemies. Now, I wonder if they're just out there tinkering around with um, explosives and you know, biological stuff and even their materials, or whether they're awesome. Conducting um, a war against us um, with our own technology. And in some other words, it's not getting the need of. Involved intimately in some sort of cyber war with us, or is there an aspect to it? Is it just communication among the cells, or what? I believe that the process of the cells is definitely using the internet and using encryption and to communicate. That's just, uh, you know, to me, it seems like common sense because it would be a great way to control the communication. Whether or not it's actually uh, obtaining skills, hacking skills, or uh, hiring people that have the skills to do cyber attacks against the critical infrastructure. I really don't know that, but I do know that other nation states, are, and even the United States of America, that they are training people in a branch of the service to do our offensive attacks and also defend our critical infrastructure. Well, I, I'm thinking of uh, power plants, I'm thinking of uh, Silos, uh, missile silos. I'm thinking of a million different things that virtually these days are controlled by computer. Um, is our infrastructure, and, uh, and I mean power plants, all the rest of it, uh, nuclear power plants, for example, are they all protected well enough? Well, I don't believe they're connected to the public internet or the critical systems or the public health not, but you have to think about what about the worker who has a laptop that's an authorized employee that's you know, that plugged in their laptop or goes to Starbucks and are enjoying a lot of data to the team that will surf the internet and this and you know, go to you know some sort of key off, you know, you can stand up with wireless network at home. It's only been a laptop back in the protected facility with what it is. Yes. Now what what type of malicious programs and worms could you know spread? In fact when we had that blackout um, many months ago, um, yeah, that was at the exact time that the MS blaster worms was at its uh, the highest infection rate. So it was, it was quite suspicious of the timing, and we have to wonder if it had the same exact uh, instant occur there. Well, uh, I know that we uh, went to war with Iraq. There are many stories floating around out there, Kevin, uh, about what the United States did. That we threw some magical switch and virtually turned off their communications, turned off their radar, acting to this, acting to that. We turned off like that before the bombs fell. But well, can you imagine if you actually have access to computing technology? Uh, like if you know how Iraq is going to acquire X amount of computer systems from a particular manufacturer in the United States government is able to uh, booby trap those systems before they're actually delivered. Now, you know, you know, we can even booby trap printers. As you can even, you know, printers are, you know, available, uh, you know, they're accessible uh, basically, you know, through TCP IP, through IP address. And you have to, you have to think about, wow, you know, you should, you are, your company or your business to be attacked to your printer that's connected to the internet that's not even protected because the owner doesn't understand what, what, what threats exist in that name. So you're saying, for example, if we could control the technological uh, flow from here to say, right, or any other country that we um, are at odds with, if we could perhaps sell them equipment with that little virtual bombs in it. And if, if, if we suddenly want to open warfare with that nation, we could, with a click of a switch and order given by a president or whoever, a military commander, we could have turned them off. Well, it's, it's a possible if, for example, you have computer hardware and you're able to switch the firmware 
So, so and that's an extra space functionality. And even things like Microsoft or the Windows options, so you know, the special version has been uh, patched on the case of delivery. It has some extra bulk muscles that they would rather not have. Yeah, it's possible. We have to think that. Installed 
during the process of upgrades as we went from operating system to operating system. We think it's possible that the US government approached Microsoft and said, look, you want to do something good for your country? Uh, we're going to set up uh, this and this and this and this. Uh, are you willing to go along? We have to think about Microsoft has control of all, all, all uh, customers' computers, right? So basically, your computer on there, well, well, you know, any type of Windows update, yeah, the app program, essentially, you need your computer. What that is doing, you know, you're not, you, you know, you're not that technically a state, so we don't go on with those programs. But I doubt that the government would approach Microsoft. I think what they would do is they'd point to operatives in the company, they would obtain jobs, and they would secretly um, uh, embed uh, weaknesses in certain areas. Uh, they'd have to be pretty stealth about it. But uh, if you have rogue developers that are, and you have, well, that might not just go for the United States government, that could probably go for any government around the world, right? Or maybe they were approached and they said no. And well, I think they do that. I think the government would keep it even secret, try to keep it secret from Microsoft. I think they would find an operative at the company or operative. And, uh, yeah, we're trying to do something that's going to be very, very, uh, 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 appearance wise, but might, uh, might assume a certain set of conditions, not just one, but a certain set of conditions that they would met. It would create uh, some sort of vulnerability. I don't know if they've done it, but. It would uh, probably make sense. Oh man, isn't that interesting? I'm getting uh, a lot of notifications on fast files from all of you that our stream, our internet stream, which goes along with the program, as you know is down. It's actually down right now, completely down, according to the people. Now, I don't know if that's all the stream, part of the stream. What's going on with the internet? I have no idea, but in honor of Kevin Mitnick being here, the stream is down hard, buddy. That's unfortunate. Yes, it is, isn't it? Um, I wonder if it has something to do with your appearance. I have appeared many times on your show before, and there's never events happened, so it's probably a light mm. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe there's those armies of uh, drones that are coming out of the French house. We just never know. And uh, maybe it's you don't need your honor, buddy. So thanks a lot. Well, I hope not. But definitely with the surge in the sort of activity, that's not going to be an honor. And I bet that's the exact line they wrote to you as a response that you should give to anybody like me. whatever. No, no, it's, it's coming from my heart. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so how dangerous now um, is all of this getting? In other words, I guess in a way I'm asking who's winning? Are the uh, software people and the people who put out all the protection programs winning? Or are the hackers and the terrorists winning? Well, it's a, I think it's a constant cat and mouse game. That, uh, uh, Companies that are innovative security companies are trying to build better and more resilient locks, and mm -hmm. we have a group of people out there that are trying to pick the locks. And it's going to be this uh, con you know, consistent uh, process you know, through the life cycle of security. It just uh, never ends. So that's why uh, we as consumers can just feel confident that if we install Eye Sweeper, that we're safe from spyware. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, what consumers want is they want the security to be transparent. They want to be able to plug in their computers to the internet, use it, and have a confidence of security. But unfortunately, when you purchase a computer, uh, you know, from Dell in the mail, or you go into a, a, a store, and you plug it in, it's not in a default you know, security configuration. You have to either learn about the technology, or you have to... Somebody to help you. Maybe the kids, you know, that's in you know, computer class. Then I think could help you. I, I, you know, I think we've talked about this before, Kevin. Frankly, um, I own a lot of key programs and a million things out there. Not really what you're doing. 
I don't really have anything on my computer that I'd be ashamed for anybody to see or worry about, however. I'm on the verge of being talked into it by friends to begin doing online banking. Now, that's a horse of a different color, buddy. A uh, big horse of a different color for me. I'm being told that online banking is every doggone bit as safe as when I walk up to my teller and I have a transaction. True. Do you want to know why? Yeah, I do want to know why. Yes, I want you to talk me into it. It's true because if there's any fraud on your account, Yes, the bank takes the risk. They take the loss. As long as you didn't authorize the transaction, um, you, didn't, you didn't authorize it, you didn't do it yourself or authorize anybody else, and there's fraud, and somebody has hacked your password or used the, used the what is commonly, commonly known as phishing, and phish your login and password from you, um, and you find out about the illicit activity within it, and uh, I think that there's a certain time period by law, maybe 30 days, 60 days, you know, that, uh, that the bank will just kind of do a little investigation. They'll have to probably sign a literary document, and you're saying this is true, even if you're doing online banking. I believe so. Right. Because, uh, I'm good. I'm from my... Um, I thought it was hysterically funny at the time. I mean, we were on ham radio, and I was talking to this fellow in Southern California, and a um, a Mexican person had somehow acquired his banking information, and he was um, he, he was doing his online banking, and it was it was I, you know other people's pain is funny, but I mean he was on the air. And telling us that this guy had his information or his card or whatever and was traveling south into Mexico. And he could literally go online and look at this guy spending his money. And he was going, oh, my God, he just spent $300 on so-and-so or $600 on so-and-so. He just bought a case of booze. He's having a blast. And, and you know, of course, it was great pain for him. As this guy traveled south, spending like crazy, uh, in, in the end, his bank took care of it and made good on it. And you're telling me that's always the case, whether you go to a teller or whether you, you, you use online banking. If something like that happens to you, they're going to cover it. I believe so. I, I believe there's certain rules, and I don't know those rules off the top of my head, but I think it's very similar to credit card fraud. I think the law is that you can be responsible for up to fifty dollars for uh, fraudulent transactions, but at the end of the day, the bank, you know, barely charges their, their customers any fee if there's fraud, and that's uh, why we have such high interest rates these days, is because the banks are taking the risk. In other countries around the world, in Eastern Europe, it's a different story. It's the consumer that takes the risk. So, um, so it's even that's where it becomes a little bit scary to be on that bank. Well, as a matter of interest, uh, Kevin, how much money do you think uh, American financial institutions are having to pony up for fraud? Well, the FBI uh, just did a new survey. Um, uh, it was called the F uh, 2005 FBI Computer Crime Survey, and I actually was a contributor to this, uh, to this um, uh, survey that had been done. Um, I, if any, uh, the numbers uh, that are that I, they, I think it was one, like the largest survey across a larger cross section of uh, several states, and it was, uh, if, if you looked at the FBI's calculation calculations, it, it was, it, it's in the billions of dollars. And if anyone's interested in the survey, I, 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 it's not on the FBI.gov site. Uh, I, I think it was up there, and it was moved. I don't know where it is, but I did put it on. My website, if anyone's interested, in, and that is www.mitnicksecurity, M-I-T-N-I-C-K, security.com, right on the homepage there in the upper left-hand corner. Anybody can pull down the recent survey that was just released, I think, a week ago. So, I assume the financial institutions don't want the public to know how much they're uh, ponying up for fraud, right? Oh, absolutely. A lot of times, uh, uh, fraud is classed under, like, a, like, a, like for example, a credit card fraud, uh, if, if they realize they're application fraud. That's where, um, that's where an individual was fraud in applying for a credit card, and uh, the bank, the, the bank loses, uh, you know, has, has suffered a loss. What happens is they'll put it into the bad loan category because they don't want to report the fraud. Mm -hmm. 
So, so what they get to uh, get from their corporate tax, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, so a lot of times losses are put in, you know, through creative accounting are put into other categories so it doesn't uh, negatively affect the company. You know, to, you know companies can't take the um, can't take a hit in the media. You know, they don't want loss in uh, customer loyalty. Right. I mean, but on the other hand, if it goes over a certain percentage, then uh, you know the company itself becomes in trouble. It's it's not anywhere near that yet, is it? As we look across various credit card companies and all the rest of them, I mean, are the losses getting so severe as to perhaps even put the company in trouble? I think so. Just recently, I don't know if you heard about this, but there was a company called Checkpoint. Uh, and what they, what, what they did is they sold information about people, uh, including social security numbers and uh, um, uh, addresses, telephone numbers. Basically, the, the dossier that you know, that they've collected through data mining and purchasing information. Yeah. And they sold this information to legitimate customers that had a need to know. Maybe uh, insurance, underwriters, law enforcement, and so on and so forth. So what had happened is um, some individuals, a fraud ring, actually applied for a checkpoint, to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's um, choice point. Checkpoint is actually a firewall firewall right. um, uh, They applied for legitimate access to the database and they were granted, you know, and they were obviously using some sort of false cover, but they had some legitimate need for this information. Sure. And what they were doing was an identity theft Oh, they were, they were they they socially engineered them. Exactly. And getting access, they actually paid for the service, but they were using uh, the information to steal. Uh, and I just saw uh, in a recent news release that the company was uh, fined like 15 million. And I think that's a substantial hit. Not only for in, in public confidence, but the you know, fifty million dollars is a drop in the bucket, at least for me. Oh no, I suppose in the large financial picture of the U.S., it is a drop in the bucket, but uh, but it's still a lot of money. And, wow. So, well, you know, to these you know, to an individual company, uh, you know, I think the I think the loss of public confidence is uh, much worse, and because of that incident, um, what had happened is it. Created this backlash in the uh, private investigation community where they were. There's a lot of databases out there that, uh, that people could have seen information about you, and several of these companies started masking the social security number. Um, some of them have not done that, and uh, usually you have to demonstrate a real need to know that you're a real business and you send somebody out to your you know, place of business to verify you are real. And you would allow you to have access to the information. And you have to think about it. A Nigerian fraud ring could simply open up a corporation, rent an office space, put in furniture, put in computers, and they, they, they look and feel like a real legitimate business. Uh -huh. And uh, but they've got to learn to write better scripts. <laughs> they, they really do. I mean, they're pathetic. I actually, you know, somewhere here I've got the recording of one, I actually called this guy in Africa. And um, I went through the whole thing with him, and um, I finally got him so exasperated. You know, I should look up that audio. I've got it here somewhere. It was an absolute riot. Have you ever done that? Have you ever called one of them? No, I never spent my time. I just did it for a hobby, just to see, you know, what would happen. And I had a You should play that audio one day. I'd love to hear it. Um, uh, not recently, I think within the last couple of years, there was a woman that worked for a New York law firm. And she received the uh, Nigerian email offering, you know, to deposit, you know, 30 years into her account, and she was able to keep like 90 percent of it. Uh -huh. Right, and and she had actually thought she had won the lottery. She was so she communicated with the people wherever they were in the world, and they needed for they needed in advance a fee to handle certain taxes and transferring and lawyers, and they needed two million dollars. So. The lady thought, well, if I can, you know, retire with 20 million, at least 20 million, all I have to do is, you know, I'm a signer for the checks of the law firm I'm working, so maybe I just send them the 2 million, wait for the deposit, I could pay the law firm back the 2 million, and I could have half the year after. Well, you know, there's nobody easier to scam than a scammer. And, 
I was going to I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. Anyway, I got this guy real frustrated. I'm doggone it, I can't find it. I will find it. And uh, and I will play it. It was actually in ref on reflection how to riot. Uh poor fellow just uh, anyway. Uh, I just kept talking about so uh, I get the money and uh, I really need a new car and he, he was just you know without you be patient. You know, Asian, guaranteed to work. I, you know, it was, it was just a riot, and I, I do have. There was really no reason I couldn't say it. Uh, sometimes do that if you want to have some fun, uh, Kevin. Call one of those numbers in Africa, and uh, and have some fun with them. It, it makes you feel better. I mean, I get so many of them in my public account that I finally just got frustrated and wanted to strike. Yeah, about a year ago, last summer I was in Amsterdam and I went to an internet cafe. With this group of uh, Nigerians, you know, like hobbled around this PC. Really? And uh, they really looked like they were doing some sort of a uh, fraud, but I kind of like stayed out of the way. I didn't want to, like, I didn't want to be noticed, uh, you know, by these people, and, you know, they come after me and something. Well, I should think you wouldn't want to be noticed by anybody near a bunch of Nigerians around the computer. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, how has life been for you uh, since? encounter with our government? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's been new and improved. I uh, started uh, uh, a security company, you know, defensive thing you, know, you mentioned in the uh, initial broadcast, yes. And then uh, I changed the name to Midnight Security because I thought it would be better to have my name in it. And what I ended up, what I, what I actually do is 75% of my time is I go around the world and I do public speaking engagements and I speak at a number of conferences and, and a number of companies talking about the uh, Security, uh, the human factor of security when it comes to social engineering, wireless security, and a, a number of different topics. So it's Mitnick, the name you know. Yeah, my last name, Mitnick. <laughs> With a CK. <tea tag. laughs> right? Well, I figured it's good for the plan, right? So, uh, so I, I, you know, I go around the world and going to Israel in mid February for speaking, I can tell them even when I come back and go to Utah to the university, then I go to uh, to South Africa. Have you ever been to Israel? No. no. Uh, you'll notice that it's, uh, it's a country of uh, very young people, many of whom carry submachine guns. Yeah, and you know that, you know that there's a, a lot of technically astute uh, people out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. It's like the, the real Silicon Valley of the world. Uh, actually, a lot of interesting uh, security type software comes out of Israel. For example, I had a gentleman uh, from Israel who wrote a program that uh, could simply analyze your voice and render up an opinion about whether you were telling the truth or a lie just based on your voice. Voice stress analysis. Yes. Uh, they really use it at checkpoints and so forth. And I think it's a sound of like a pocket version. Oh, it's <laughs> very effective. Very effective. How are we doing in that world, by the way, of uh, voice recognition and face recognition? I remember I went to the Super Bowl, told you, and they took a picture. That was the first one where they took everybody's picture and uh, looked in, uh, you know, files to see if you were a bad guy. I, I think it's getting better. I think that, that, you know, about a year ago, you know, the technology was in its infancy. And I think as you know, time moves on, that a lot of, a lot of these companies are developing better biometric technology. But the problem is, is the, it's early. There's not much early adopters. Now, maybe in very secure facilities, uh, they're uh, using biometrics, but I really don't see uh, that as a, a, a huge trend. You have to think about because of all the online fraud, and I think a lot of the banks and financial financial institutions wouldn't necessarily use biometrics, but they use what they call form factor application, which actually means uh, uh, it, it means that you have you know a piece of information, something that you know, you might have a device like a smart card, and with the combination of having the card and you swipe through like your card reader, having like a pin code, then you, you know that raises a level of confidence that you already you see are. But the problem is with the fraud losses that are actually the losses that are actually reported as fraud. Those numbers aren't high enough to justify putting in stronger authentication systems mm. because it's too costly to roll out. But there are other innovative companies that are trying to build in two-factor authentication, like 
for example, is a company that if you log on to your bank account, it might present an image of an airplane. And you know that if you visit your bank and you don't see an image of your airplane, the airplane before you log in, yes, that it's likely to be not really the bank site, but a, a focus site that somebody's trying to deceive you into logging in that and to steal your username and to steal your password. Mm -hmm. I, I must say it was from me. James E. Hansen, longtime director of the agency Stoddard Institute for Space Studies, said in an interview that officials at NASA headquarters had ordered the public affairs staff to review the summing lecture papers, any postings on the Goddard website, and requests for interviews from journalists. In my, in my world, that's a wow. Kevin Mitnick, back in moments. <laughs> Okay, for the sake of my audience, I think I want to get practical with uh, Kevin for a moment here. And Kevin, what I mean by that is uh, there are a million different things offering to remove spyware from your computer, offering to remove viruses, offering to prevent viruses. What I'd like to know is what's really good, what's the best advice you can give an individual uh, either with respect to a program uh, to have, or what to do, um, firewalls, I don't know, what's really good out there? Well, first of all, uh, personal firewall, uh, Microsoft XP, the Service Pack 2, well, it, it, like Windows had a very firewall the Service Pack 1, the Service Pack 2, Microsoft, and the rest of the rules, all the other things are done by default. And what that does is it blocks malicious incoming connections. So anybody trying to connect your computer from the outside, however, it doesn't stop malicious programs from connecting out. So a more resilient uh, firewall, actually, the one that I uh, I use myself when I'm using Windows is one called Zonalar. Zonalar. Yeah. yeah, it's a little firewall. I actually thought the program used to have real good My question would be, and you've never done that, but you just never use it as a thing. That's what they want. It's really very good. I don't know what I'm saying. My question would be, like a radar detector, but I'm not sure that's what it is. 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 Um, I'm <laughs> 
Yeah, I tend to do the same thing. Just go on, go on, go on, keep going. I mean, but it's so sad. Yeah, what do you have to do? Well, think about what John did with the digital rights management uh, software that they were secretly embedding in their computer to, uh, to control access to music and the video. Um, wow. That was the technology that that we call in the field is called rootkit technology is where the operating system is modified in such a way that you can hide files, hide processes. All right, now let's talk about this for a second. Uh, whether it's music or movies, I, I criticize with the, um, with the artists and, and the producers and the motion picture companies on this. My God, I have seen a ruin. I, I really think it has the potential to ruin the record industry, to ruin the motion picture industry the minute a movie gets out. It's really not that for them, right? Millions of people are downloading the poppy millions, downloading both music and, uh, and movies so that we can get into the theater. It's, uh, it's a ripoff of these artists and these companies, and it's not right. It's stealing. Well, I understand your position, but what I'm talking about here is you have a company, a third-party company that's planting software yes. secretly within your computer that if an attacker understands how the software works, they can use it as a conduit as an evil thing to I see. So, in other words, uh, in an effort to protect, they're opening the door. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I don't take issue with any company but if I install, uh, 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 you know, if I put a CD in my in my system and install some sort of product that is secretly and uh, some sort of uh, uh, management uh, software, I got my permission or consent, especially if it's really very where I can't really see uh, what's there. Hey, Kevin, do we need laws about this? Or do we have laws about this? Maybe we do, and I don't know it. In other words, if you produce a piece of software, and whoever you are, and you put something in it for some commercial reason, for your company, a reasonable thing, I guess, to do, um, there's no law against that, though. Well, usually I think that these companies are able to uh, cover themselves or not, and have very limited liability. Because in a long license agreement, you have to, you know, what you read. Yes. We probably have an idea of what we're doing. You know, you're right. I've never actually taken the time to read one of those. I always think, yeah, sure, I accept the terms and the conditions. No, I never read one of them myself. Does it have to say down? Do you think down your bottom? Oh, by the way. I don't know who you're watching. What are you doing your computer? I mean, that's why you do that every day, so you can go to a monastery and capture it and use it for a long time. I think you know what I mean. 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 You know what I mean